Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Sir Terry Pratchett is today's London Book Fair Author of the Day, a date that the International Authors Forum has designated as International Sir Terry Pratchett Day. His work is adored by millions of readers worldwide for its genre-defying blend of comedy, fantasy, and science fiction is the focus of a program of events to celebrate the writer's place at the heart of the international publishing industry. Terry's literary influence spans the globe and through sales of more than 85 million books in 37 languages, he's often credited as being the impetus in encouraging new generations of readers. Now, no one is sorrier that Terry couldn't be here today than Terry himself, but in true Hollywood style, he sent us this message. Hello, London Book Fair. I really wish I could be with you. But sooner or later, a writer has to earn his crust. And my crust is quite crusty <laughs> at the moment. Looking forward to the results of the Terry Prackett Day. I've got a day. <laughs> yeah. There! Which one was it? Not last week. <laughs> I think I used that one up. And I vote for Commander Vimes. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. There's likely to be tinctures of some kind. Okay, the vote that um, uh, Terry's referring to, and I think David's going to mention it later on, is there's a wall behind, and we'd all like you to participate. David will give you the details. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce the eminent speakers at this session. Stephen uh, Baxter is the co-author with Terry of, amongst others, the hugely successful Long Earth series, and he's in conversation today with David Bradley, the editor-in-chief of SFX and Comic Heroes. The gentlemen, take it away. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, of course, so we're here with uh, Stephen Baxter, who uh, is, of course, um, uh, the vice president of the International H.G. Wells Society. Is that, yes, is that the case? Yes, that's true. Uh, and uh, the winner of many distinguished awards yourself, including the, uh, the Philip K. Dick Award and the BSFA Award. And you're able to give us an insight into uh, working with Terry Pratchett, because, of course, you've worked on him uh, on two books that have already been published. So we'll talk a little bit about that, I hope. Um, but before we start, I just want to remind everyone, yes, we are um, voting for the number one character from the novels of Sir Terry Pratchett. Um, and uh, when we finish talking here, I hope you'll go to uh, londonbookfair.co.uk to vote for your favorite character. Sir Terry has selected his 10 favorite characters himself. And perhaps we can talk about our own favourites uh, as we talk today. But uh, and if you need reminding, uh, as if you did, but if you, if you do need reminding, there's a wall uh, down there which has the the characters that uh, that Terry has suggested. Uh, so uh, what I thought we'd, we'd get start talking about is, um, uh, of course. Uh, Terry is most famous perhaps for 40 Discworld novels, but right now his most recent, recent book uh, series is The Long Earth, which he's yes. been writing with you. So um, how did that collaboration come about? Um, well, I suppose the root of it is uh, um, shared enthusiasms, really. Terry was a science fiction fan uh, long before he was a, a, an SF author yeah. uh, or a fantasy author. And I think his reading when he was 16 or so was Arthur C. Clarke, you know, as right. opposed to Tolkien. And of course, the fantasy genre wasn't what it was, what it is now mm -hmm. in those days. And his first couple of novels were included science fiction novels, Strata, and, uh, and he's always remained a science fiction fan. Can you all hear OK? It, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the noise is baffling, yeah, isn't it? At this end, yeah, it sounds yeah. quite... <laughs> it's great to see all these people here, though. Know, yeah, amazing. With no seats. <laughs> You think of this moment. shed that could give you a seat, but there you go. <laughs> uh, and, oh, the books, there's going to be a book signing at the end down in oh, Foils. Oh, yes, of course, that's right. Yes, yeah. um, uh, yes uh, Stephen will be signing uh, copies at the end band down there at Foils afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so, so Terry, I mean, I met him 20-something years ago at a Clark Award. Right. He wasn't nominated, and I was nominated, but he didn't win, but we met anyway. <laughs> and then we'd, we'd bump into each other at conventions over the years, and Terry was a, remained an SF fan. He liked my work. He mm. turned up at panels I was on and so on. And for a long time, we went through a series of dinners at the time of the London Book Fair with the, the um, chief executive of the, of the, of the Book Fair, right. Jack Thomas, mm -hmm. who's in the publishing industry herself. She hosted a dinner for our agents, and Terry would be there, and I'd be there, and we'd talk about 
Terry would say, what news of the quantum, he'd say to me. I, I was one of his, I was a <laughs> science buff for, for him. But a few years ago, Terry just mentioned this aborted project he had, mm. uh, which became The Long Earth. Right. Uh, uh, dating back to the 80s, when he was writing SF novels and Discworld novels, um, he started this project. I think he got stuck with it. Mm. But then... Uh, Discworld took off with the third or fourth book. So that was clearly the way for him to go. Yes. But he stayed, the thing stayed in his back drawer, you know. Mm. Yes, yeah. Finally, he came back up again at this dinner party and we started talking about this. And this is a, that's great, Terry. All, you know, it's, it's a simple idea. There's a world next door into which you can just step, like ours, but there's no humans, basically. Mm. And, and another world, and another world. It's very grounded, very domestic, kind of, it's almost fantasy, but it's got a science fictional framework to it immediately. Right, right. The further right you go, the more different the worlds are. And I thought, well, this is great. And then we, we, we sat there talking away. And you, you, know, you can do pioneering stories, exploration stories, frontier stories, um, exotic flora and fauna, cosmic destiny. You know, what's the meaning of this panoply? Of what? Um, I think Simon Taylor's over there somewhere. He keeps on using the word myriad. Myriad <laughs> worlds of the, of, the, of, the, of the long world, of the long earth. So it's clearly full of ideas. Well, we got thrown out in the end after having... <laughs> We were gassing about this until two in the morning at this dinner party. And we went from there, really. There was a, our agents swooped down and saw a sort of commercial opportunity. And we went from there. So we spent about six months. That we live at opposite ends of the country. Um, so we spent about six months developing our ideas on the phone, basically, mm -hmm. long phone calls. Then I went down to Terry's for a long weekend, and we met at conventions and things again, working up ideas and, uh, uh, and so on. But basically, enthusiasm. I mean, our reference points were classic SF of the past. Right. Clark, James Blish, people like that, Clifford Simak. Mm. Uh, and that's where it came from, really. Any, any collaboration, I've, I've collaborated with Clark in the past. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And authors are used to working solo. You know, you're used to being in, in complete control of your material until it gets handed to the editors, mm -hmm. the publishers. But in this case, you know, you get this collision of ideas and uh, egos and hissy fits. <laughs> and, uh, were, were there rows? Is that <laughs> no, more like hissy fits, I'd say. Oh, okay. <laughs> One of us would get the hump. And, uh, uh, but but we, we, we got, you know, pub lunches, we got through all that mm. in that way. The great thing about it is, though, you, t you, you might start with some idea, which then Terry would elaborate, and, and you go backwards and forwards. You come up with something that's like, it's like there's a third person in the room, yeah. in a way. An idea that's not what you would have come up with yourself, Either of us, but it, which is better than than either of us would have come up in, in that context. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very satisfying. And about the writing process itself. So I remember that um, uh, that Terry revealed to me uh, once that he had talked to Larry Niven about doing a collaboration yeah. many years ago, but it didn't come together. And the reason it didn't come together is that Larry Niven was a very meticulous planner. He'd have a card for every scene <laughs> or something. Whereas Terry, in his own words, would write. He'd put Commander Vimes on a page and push him around and see what happens. Yeah. So how does that work when you're writing with you? Are you one, one or are either of those kinds of writers? Well, I'm a bit more Nivenish than Pratchettish oh, in that right. way. But yeah, that's exactly how he writes, actually. He's, yeah. he, 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 he says he likes to get two characters in a room with some, some premise, you know, and just follows the thread. So, and he'll go for 40,000 words, a novel might come out of it, or yeah. he might put it aside and use it later. So his, that's his way of, he follows the characters and, 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 and the stories emerge. But with something like The Long Earth, mm. you know, it's a landscape and you need a time scale as humanity moves out. You know, up 10 years later, the, the world has changed yeah. um, in all sorts of ways. So that's where my strengths more came in. Right. The hard SF is more physics-based, engineering-based, science-based. Um, and you need to plan, you know, you need these plans some kind of landscape and time scale, which gets beaten up and moved around right. uh, in the course of the writing. But uh, yeah, I remember turning up that first time with Terry, and I'd done some of this stuff, <laughs> tables and Excel spreadsheets and things, just trying to get a rough idea of how it might go. Uh, 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 Appalled, is that the right word? <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, we did use all that stuff. You know, you explore it. If it's useful, you keep it. If, it, mm. if it's not useful, you, cha you change it. But I remember particularly Terry's way of working. We, we started following his early drafts, which mm. had the main characters and the main situations and the premise. But we got into a... We diverted into the backstory of Joshua, who's our sort of protean mm. hero. Mm. Kind of a mixed up kid, but he's got this talent. He's a proto-stepper. He he's one of the first who's able to do this transitioning. Um, and Terry just, we, we, half dictating, half discussing, um, he went off into this digression into the 15-year-old Joshua, mm. who's a mixed up kid in a home. Uh, he's got these strengths, but he's learned to keep it quiet, you mm. know, and he's a very introverted kid. <clears throat> And it was quite remarkable seeing this stuff came out. I think actually it was like Tiffany Aching. Yes. You know, yes. Terry seems to be very good at these 
they're not really mixed up kids. They're in the wrong place, kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 so that was you know for me that was fascinating to follow how uh, uh, this just sort of emerged somehow from Terry's subconscious. But that really grounded Joshua. Yeah. And his story is going to be the arc of the whole series in the end. Did you find that um, it was? I'm sure it isn't as simplistic as this. That well, so Terry is most famous for writing satire, and of course the Discworld books are very funny. Um, and uh, you write a lot of hard science fiction and uh, and a lot of kind of end of the world uh, type type of things. Yeah. Did, did you find that um, that is it as simple as you brought the science and he brought the funny, or was there was there more to it than that? Did you did you kind of overlap during the process? Oh, we over overlapped a lot actually. Yeah. 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 Oh, so some of the jokes in there are my jokes, okay. yeah. <laughs> but they had to get through Terry. If they made Terry laugh, then they're going to make anybody laugh, aren't they? Uh, for instance, I think it's in book two. There's lots of jokes about um, Moby Dick. They were right. mine, basically. <laughs> um, uh, but Terry came up with some of the science as well. As we were yeah. planning the thing out, he thought I was being a bit too linear and orderly. Yeah. He came up, came up with the idea of jokers, which are just random worlds, totally different from anything you'd expect right. as a, in a sort of linear progression, yeah. which made it a really interesting, you know, semi-chaotic kind of environment to, to work in. Yeah. Um, but, but no, Terry was reaching back to his science fiction roots, I yeah. think. He always wanted to have uh, a kind of pastoral exploration saga mm. where you can just walk or take a wagon through to this, these, these exotic worlds. On the one hand, no spaceships. Right. But on the other hand, he, he, he was keen to have the whole thing climax in um, the, a, a meaning of life kind of thing. Not necessarily the end of the universe, but a cosmic perspective on mm. the whole thing. And that's what we're working towards. It ended up being a five book series, or it will be. And it grew, we, we signed up for two books originally. And Terry came up with the title after after the second book, as he thought, The Long Mars. And I thought, yeah. oh, great. You know, that, that's a yeah, great way to yeah. move it on. But then the first book grew and grew and grew, and it became, the first book kind of became the first two books. Right, right. The Long Mars is now going to be book three. And after that, we're off to the cosmos a bit more, mm. but still grounded with the characters and the, the locations, Madison, Wisconsin, and, and so on. So, no, the, it's, it's a mix, but with, it's Terry reaching back to his... Is, is SF reading, really, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, some of um, Terry's early books, like Strata, you mentioned, for instance, he's writing science fiction. But that's you can see the prototype of the disc world in Strata, actually, with the sort of layered worlds. I know yeah. that... Um, I know that, uh, that Terry's a big fan of your work. He spoke very kindly of Voyage, for instance, uh, yes. which he said felt very real, apart from the fact that it was made up. <laughs> yes. um, but you were always a fan of Terry Pratchett as well. Had you, had you read the Discworld books and things? Right? Well, yeah, actually, yes. And I, 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 I was actually a fan before Discworld. That I liked okay. those early SF novels. Right. I was slightly disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> from my point of view, when he turned to Discworld. Right, right. Until I actually read them. Um, you know, but, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not having been to the Discworld cons. I, I, I'd hesitate to call myself a fan because the fans right. are fantastic experts and they love it and cherish it. Mm. Uh, oh yes, but I'm a, I'm a reader. But I like, um, I like the early ones with Rincewind and yeah. the, the Last Hero, those kind of books with flying yeah. around the Discworld. Um, but there's others, others as well that take my fancy going postal I liked and um, the Monstrous Regiment, the, yeah. the, 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 the soldier stories, Commander Vimes, who could not like Commander Vimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, I was, I was aware of all that. But then, in a way, he's followed his own trajectory, hasn't he, with the Discworld. It's yeah, become absolutely less of a medieval fantasy uh, uh, parody yeah. and more, well, he's ab advancing towards the present. We're in a kind of Victorian London now, aren't we? With absolutely, yeah. Steam. yeah. Absolutely. Well, the, the disc world has, has almost advanced in real time um, so that, it, uh, that if you look at the TV adaptations of his books, for instance, recently when Sky One adapted them, the David Jason starring Colour of Magic was a, a sort of an epic medieval fantasy world reflecting yeah. what the books were like at the time, as you say, when he started writing Discworld. Uh, and then when they came to adapt Going Postal, uh, it's very Dickensian, and I yes. think that, that reflects the fact that the books have, have advanced in real time. But it, it does get in, it enable him to indulge his love of things like of science. You know, you have, um, uh, the, you know, Raising Steam was the most recent one, for instance, which just came out last year and is out in paperback this September. And that's, yeah. you know, locomotive science, and that and that that, that is all in there. Um, does yeah. he? Um, uh, do you find that um, uh, that that um, the the satire that that Terry brings? So, despite the fact that it started as a sort of satire of medieval fantasy literature is yeah. now actually tackling very big topics like uh, well, terrorism, perhaps, in the most recent one, and, and yeah. that, you know that kind of thing, um, as well as um, uh, society and tax and things. Is when you're working with Terry, do you get the impression that he's very much interested in uh, so, sort of social? Um, politics exactly not the word I'm looking for, although there's a lot of that in the books too. Is, oh. he, is he very conscientious? Uh, yeah. 
social politics, yeah, social issues, certainly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very moral, he's a very moral yes, character. Moral, morality, yeah. Um, he's, he sees good in people, you know, I mean, so, and, and this overlaps with the Long Earth as well, you know. Mm. Mm. Joshua is like Tiffany, basically good people in a difficult world. Um, and he, uh, he, he does rail against the, the flaws of humanity. Yeah. So, in, so in, the, um, in the Long Earth, people doing evil off in some corner of the Long Earth, you know, he's clamps down, he likes to clamp down on that. But in Discord as well, I mean, many, many of them are thinly veiled comments, aren't they, on discrimination, that kind of yes, thing. Yes, exactly, yeah. Thud, books like that, I guess. Yeah. He's got all these races against whom discrimination can't be leveled in the Discord, of course. Yeah. The yeah. trolls and the dwarfs and so on. So he's, oh yeah, I think this very strong moral core shines through. I think even in the earliest books, like, like Fantastic, for instance, is the disaster story, the Red Star the, the, the approaching the Discworld. Yeah. And then people go crazy and pick on categories yeah. to, you know, String him up, it's their fault, you know. Yeah, yeah. So he's got, he's, he just had this very, very human, this human and humanistic uh, yeah. moral core, I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And a kind of faith in, in people, too. Um, when you look at something like Tolkien, for instance, which, um, you know, is the, 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 um, the, the prime mover of fantasy, there's, there's no good orc in that. And I, I know Terry <laughs> spoke about this a number of times. Orcs are just bad. There's a very kind of species delineation of types of people, yeah. whereas Terry never stands for that. People are always people and they have you know they're, they're very you know trolls are good and bad trolls and a lot yeah. of that that humor i think that, that terry has is putting ordinary people's voices and failings and virtues in the voices in the you know in the mouths of quite distinct characters yes that's it isn't it yes yeah. in Discworld, they're all yeah. people yeah. They, they, they may be funny shapes and they may be werewolves or whatever but they're all people yeah. are just as flawed and varied as as regular people so you can't categorize them in that way no yeah. absolutely yeah. i i spoke uh I interviewed terry a couple of years ago for the magazine and um I asked him about influences on Discworld, what went into the makeup of his, his type of writing. And it was fascinating how much sort of popular culture and unusual references there were in there. So, for instance, he spoke about uh, Punch magazine for the humour, which he read yeah. a lot of when he was young, and G.K. Chesterton as yeah. well. And then he said, he thought for a minute and went, Galaxy Quest, <laughs> which, which <laughs> yes. I think is quite interesting. And, and there's lots of that about it as well. He also said that um, one of his favourite hobbies... Uh, I, I suspect before his, his diagnosis, unfortunately, not long ago, was uh, painting Citadel miniatures, those war, war oh, gaming yes. figures. And um, uh, he said that, that, that he loved that. And um, he said that, uh, that that was a huge influence on him. And he said he's glad that he didn't discover them in the 80s, because if he had, mm. he would never have written any books. <laughs> it yes. would just be a war gamer. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, yes, and he loves games, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think Oblivion is the one that he particularly likes. Oh, yeah. He, he's a modder. You, you, you know no, no, what I mean. No, yeah. no, no. I, I, we, you we, get in and modify the game and contribute to absolutely, it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, he tweaks with the game. We, we talked about this a lot. I was surprised again yeah, to find out uh, the, what a huge video gamer he is as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, we mentioned about him wanting to collaborate with Larry Niven. He said that when he was over there for a convention in the, in the US, and, and yeah, he's still very much part of the convention scene, isn't he? he does a lot oh, he of is, yeah, yeah. When he was over there in the US, um, and uh, it was a, an early computer, I can't remember what it was, probably a very early PC in the 80s. He so said they were supposed to be talking about work, and they just wound up playing elite or something yes. perhaps. <laughs> um, so I, I think just looking at the, uh, at the time, we said we'd take some questions from, from the audience. Yep. Should, should we do that? Is anyone, does anyone have any questions uh, uh, for Stephen about, uh, about working with uh, Terry, about the Long Earth series or, or anything? Or anything really, yeah, yeah, anything we can ask perhaps about. Yeah. What is your long-term plan for the Long Earth series? Do you have a, a, a plan that says there's going to be X number of books or are you kind of making it up as you go along when you start on a new book? Um, I, we didn't have a long-term plan at the beginning, I don't think. We kind of followed where it was going to go uh, to some extent. Uh, but we, I, think we've, I think we're pretty definite now. We know what's going to be in... Well, book three is done, and be, that'll be out in a couple of months. Uh, but yeah, book, book four and book five, I think we know where we're going now. And it's this, uh, as I said, you know, it's this journey from the very domestic and almost, almost the present day... Mm. Joshua in his home in Madison, Wisconsin, and the modern Earth, all the way to a revelation about the uh, the meaning of life and the, and the destiny for mankind. So we, we do have a plan, but it's a very Terry-ish plan. <laughs> he says he doesn't want any gods for a start in the long Earth universe. No god, um, and no and no um, overwhelmingly superior aliens who've tinkered with our destiny from the mm. beginning. That kind of thing. Yeah, what yeah. he thinks is a it's a, a cop out, really. It's it's, yeah. it's god yeah, yeah, yeah. in scientific trapping. So, so I, th I, th I think we know where we're going now, but that's after, well, including a year of work or so. What must, mm. I think it must be four years now since that dinner party when, yeah, he, yeah, when, yeah. He, when he, he dropped this thing on the lap. So, um, and to, but to be honest, The Long Earth is like the Discworld. You know, you could tell any kind of story in there yeah. uh, that you like. So there's possibility for future work in there in the end. But I think we call it the Joshua arc. You know, it's going to be Joshua's story from beginning to end and his 
traumas and trials of, mm. of life and so forth. I, th I think we know where we're going now, yes. Um, actually, can I maybe um, sort of address the elephant in the room, the fifth elephant in the room? Um, is, is Terry, now he's, he's unwell, um, you've seen him probably more recently than me and speak to him fairly frequently, I think. Yeah. Is, is he OK? Does he still write the same way that he used to write? Um, well, the big change with Terry has been his, his vision. You know, he got this peculiar form of precursor Alzheimer's that affected his vision processing. And in fact, the first detection he had of it, he was, he was, look, he's got a telescope in his back garden in an observatory under a dome. Fantasy, yeah. And he was looking for Jupiter. His PA was there, and he could see Jupiter, and Terry couldn't. Right. Thought there's something wrong with his eyes, but no, it's this. That was the first right. indication. So he can't read well. He can't write well that way. So he's got voice recognition software. Right. And with the back, you've probably seen the the, the the documentaries. This big bank of screens yeah, yeah. with a bit of text here, a bit of text there. Uh, so but I think in a way that suits his way of writing, because as you say, he likes to sort of follow a lead yeah. and and not plan very much. Mm. And he, he he does. He'll sit and think for a while, then come up with a perfect sentence. Right. As opposed to me, I'll just write something down and fiddle with it. <laughs> so, in a way, that's, uh, that's suited him. Mm. Uh, but that's been his, his major obstacle, I think. Yeah. Uh, but he, he just born that stoically. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, as, uh, I mean, what a terrible thing to happen to a writer, you know, suddenly yeah. not to be able to read properly. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, but no, he's, he's, he's got his routine, he's got his PA who goes through his drafts with him, mm. or I do if I'm there. Um, no, so he's working on, you know, yeah. It's, it seems very much like him as well to to seek a very practical scientific solution to the problem as well with the voice recognition software and rigging up all the computers and things. I well, bet probably yeah. quite enjoyed that, actually. Well, he has. But he's, he's worked with the, um, with, with, with the, the, the VCR company yeah. who've, who've uh, um, produced a custom version for him. He's kind of oh, pushing okay. the edge of, of what's possible. Right. There's, there's a Terry Pratchett version of this software, is there? Well, there is. <laughs> but he has to teach it Discworld words. Right, you know, right, uh, yeah. uh, right. Weatherwax and so on. <laughs> uh, were there any other, other questions, perhaps, from... Oh, Hi, um, I was just intrigued to know what the editing process is like when you're doing a collaboration. I mean, presumably you have a close relationship with an editor and Terry would also have an editor that he has a close relationship with. Do those editors fight it out between themselves as well or, or just one sort of... Oh, no, we just got the one editor for... I've got my other books with Galang, so that's a different publisher. So just the one editor for, uh, for uh, The Long Earth, who's not Terry's editor for Discworld, by right. the way. So it's, it's uh, Simon Taylor, who's more of a science fiction uh, buff. Uh, this, but there is a kind of editing process we have to do late in the process. You know, we, we go through these discussions and we come up with storylines mm. and things and bits of material. But we always separate for three months or six months or something. Mm -hmm. Work, and both of us go off in directions we didn't expect. And I remember the shock for me of the first one, having to, I got the job of editing right. the, 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 the strands together, if you see what I mean. And then took it back down to Terry, this tatty manuscript, and read it. I mean, that was the way to do oh, it. Right, okay. Literally read it to him over a, a week or so. Uh, and we, we changed every line. So now people will say, this word here, is that yours or Terry's, yours or Terry's? Mm -hmm. Well, neither really, you know. It's whoever, it, wherever it started from. It's mm. been through this filtering yeah. of, 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 of the two of us. Um, so so that's, that's, that's the way that works. But, but yeah, just, just the one editor at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that uh, um, at 12 o'clock we'll go down and do your signing and um, yeah. people will um, uh, get to vote. So talking about that vote, there is at londonbookfair.co.uk the opportunity to vote for your favourite Terry Pratchett character. And Terry selected his, his uh, favourite 10 to, to vote from. So I've got to ask you, who's your favourite character from Terry Pratchett's books? I'm going to go for Rincewind, I think, on reflection. Rincewind, because he's the first you meet, isn't he, at the beginning of the series. I've always enjoyed his adventures mm. when they've come back up. He always has these fantastical adventures that take him over the edge, mm. you know. And he's, and he's also a very honest character, isn't he? He knows he's a coward. <laughs> he knows that running is his only option, and, and yet he endures even so. So I, I like that kind of, you know. He's a bit like Flashman, you know. <laughs> Flashman knows he's, he's a bad man, but he doesn't care. He's, he's, and, and he's realistic about the world in a way that uh, other characters aren't. Yeah. And Rincewind's the same. He just knows the world is a dangerous place and all you can do is run. Yes. So, Rincewind. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, um, if, if I have the opportunity to influence anyone, I'm saying vote for Commander Vimes, because I think Vimes is a great character. Yeah. And also allows Terry to write, basically, police procedurals, which are perfect for the disc world, to, yes. to take people through the city of Ang Um So, um, uh, in that case, I guess we'll, we'll move to uh, the uh, Stephen Baxter signing. Yep, good. At uh, Foils, which is just down there. Uh, and there's also, yes, do look out for the wall where, um, which will give you some inspiration to vote for your favourite Terry Pratchett character. Okay, well, thank you, Dave. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.